is now clock. Emery, are you ready? Yep, I'm good. Uh, will you turn your camera on? Yep. Okay. Hello, uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome you again to this World River and the Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. Today is the, our webinar 2021 number 26. So uh, we invite Dr. <coughs> Emily V um, come here to talk about uh, the sediment routing in the Gulf of Papa. So uh, during the last uh, uh, sea level cycle. Uh, before I introduce uh, Emily, and uh, I would like to mention uh, this coming Friday. So this Friday, so we will have a uh, Dr. Francis Peterson from uh, Richard University. Uh, she come here, we'll talk about uh, the organic carbon transport, particularly lipid biomarker perspective, and a key study of uh, upper reach small base in Amazon and Godavari in India and a small creek in UK. So please mark your calendar this coming Friday. So that's another biochemical uh, talk. And so here, Emery, um, currently Emery is uh, working at USGS at St. Pittsburgh and Emery uh, get a, much, a bachelor degree from Midbury College and a master and a PhD uh, in scripts, uh, Institute of Oceanography, working with uh, uh, as Dr. Professor Neil Driscoll. So, uh, uh, so uh, Emily uh, working on uh, her PhD dissertation on the fly river derived sediment in the Papua New Guinea. So today uh, we invite her to talk about the sediment routing with the sea level change. Okay, Emily, now I can, you know, give the floor to you. Please share your screen and uh, put a presentation mode. Okay, great. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, well, hi, and I hope everyone is doing safe and well during this pandemic. And I'd like to thank Paul for giving us the opportunity to present our work and um, also for the great introduction. I'm Emily Way, and I'm currently a postdoc at the USGS St. Pete Coastal Marine Science Center. And I conducted this work with Neil Driscoll at Scripps and Rudy Slingerland at Penn State. Sorry. Okay. The main focus of my talk is to study how morphology influences the response of two types of rivers base level changes. And here are our main findings. First, sea level modulates the geometry of inner shelf deposits and where sediment deposits are located. And secondly, the Fly River responds differently than small mountainous rivers to sea level changes. And during intermediate low stands, such as MIS-3, the Fly River may bypass the inner shelf and deposit in Pandora Trough. And we observe this with clay mineralogy. Here's the outline of my talk. Um, first, I'll introduce the geologic setting. And part one investigates the three-dimensionality of inner mid-shelf clinothems and the processes that form it. And it's published in marine geology. And part two uses clay mineralogy to constrain sediment routing during the last sea level cycle. And this is published in sedimentology. Also, if you are interested in high resolution paleo mag records from the Gulf of Papua, I wanted to include a citation from Marcuson et al 2019, which used the same suite of sediment cores. And high resolution radiocarbon dates from this study reveal that the modern clinothem is much younger than previously proposed. <clears throat> this work is a collaborative effort. And for part one, I would like to thank my co-authors, Neil and Rudy, and we had help acquiring radiocarbon ages from Rachel, Anna, Jeff, and Alex. Um, for core and seismic collection, I would like to thank the crew of the RV Melville and the Oregon State Coring Group. Additionally, many folks helped us with measuring clay mineralogy and interpreting the results. Um, I'd like to thank Miriam, Robert, James, Brian, and Gustav from Scripps. 
I ran XRD at San Diego State University and could not have done it without the help of Heather, Joan, and Jillian. And lastly, I'd like to thank, oh, sorry. Um, I'd like to thank Larry for help sampling the Pandora trough cores at U Miami. And finally, we'd like to thank JP and John for their helpful insight. <clears throat> so my research is focused on inner shelf and deep sea deposits. And here is a cross section of a continental margin. And it shows that it is composed of many sediment units. Each are outlined in black that are stacked vertically. Each unit is called a clinoform and stacks of clinoforms are called clinothems. Um, clinothems are important building blocks of margins. And the geometry of clinothems are typically considered in two dimensions in this across shore direction. In the first studies on continental margin deposits, assume that there was little variability along the margin or in this direction. And instead, my research shows that clinothems and continental margins display three-dimensional variability. And this variability is due to tectonics, oceanographic currents, and physiography, such as shelf width. Papua New Guinea is an ideal location to study source to sink processes from shelf to slope, and this is partly due to its high sediment yield, strong climatic forcing and tectonic deformation. And the figure in the upper left shows that the island of New Guinea contributes around 6,800 millitons of sediment to the ocean per year, um, with Papua New Guinea shown here. And in the lower right, we outlined the Gulf of Papua. And uh, this suggests that rivers contribute around 365 millitons of sediment to the Gulf annually. <clears throat> Here's a map of our study site, which is uh, the Gulf of Papua. And this black box shows its location just north of Australia. Here we identify five main tributaries that discharge into the Gulf. We have the Fly, Bamu, Tarama, Kikori, and Purari rivers. The physiography and shelf width in the Gulf are affected by tectonics. First, we observe that the Fly River has a wide floodplain, whereas small mountainous rivers with origins in the high mountains have narrow floodplains. Second, we observe that offshore of the Fly River, the inner shelf is wide, and this narrows to the west, um, such that it is only 10 kilometers adjacent to the Purari River. The Gulf of Papua was formed by northward subduction in foreland basin tectonics. In the upper left, this black arrow through the Gulf of Papua locates the cross section, which is shown below. And here, the southern foot wall subducts under the northern hanging wall. Thrusting creates the mountainous terrain of the Papua New Guinea highlands. And adjacent to the highlands is the Gulf of Papua, which is deepest in the northeast Gulf and shallows towards the southwest. Our present day knowledge of Gulf of Papua sediment dispersal comes from many source to sink studies that have used a nested approach. And this is a large nested examination of the Gulf of Papua during an ONR initiative called Stratiform. And these studies have investigated various timescales of deposition from recent mud plume sedimentation to longer records. And today I will focus on longer records from sediment cores and seismic profiles to look at how it changes over a sea level cycle. Our studies use gravity and piston cores um, shown here to ground truth seismic data. And first we describe the facies in the core, then we sample for benthic and planktonic foraminifera to obtain radiocarbon ages. And in part two, we sampled the cores for X-ray diffraction, which tells us sediment provenance. <clears throat> To understand clinothem formation and the processes that shape them, we use chirp seismic reflection. And this is high resolution and images the upper 50 meters of the seafloor. And uh, chirp records impedance contrasts, which are the product of velocity and density. And sediment layers record earth history, much like tree rings. Um, when we collect seismic data, we tow the chirp instrument behind the ship, which sends down a pulse that is then reflected by the seafloor um, and then we keep on moving. And collecting chirp is much like mowing the lawn. And here are the track lines for our survey in black. 
And we collected sediment cores along these lines, which are shown by the white cores. Sorry, by the white circles. Now I'll move on to part one. In this first part of my talk, I will focus on the inner mid-shelf clinothem, which is highlighted in this yellow box. Principles of sequence stratigraphy predict that clinothem geometry is affected largely by relative sea level in the across margin direction, and that's indicated by this red arrow here. Eustatic or global sea level has changed, and this is shown by the curve in the upper right. Here we are in the present at zero meters, and as we move to the right along the X axis and go back in time, we observe many rises and falls in sea level. And you may know two high stands in sea level that occurred at the present and also during marine isotope stage 5A or MIS 5A. There has also been a maximum low stand at MIS 2 or marine isotope stage 2 and an intermediate stage at MIS 3. The inner mid-shelf clinothem is composed of stacked sediment units that were deposited during high stands and intermediate high stands in sea level. And these units are units D, C, and A. And in the next slides, I will walk you through the geometry of the inner mid-shelf clinothem and the time periods during which, during which each unit formed. Um, although I will be showing you seismic profiles in two dimensions, Keep in mind that clinothems are three-dimensional deposits and they're influenced by tectonics, oceanographic currents, and physiography. The lowermost unit is unit D, and that's shown here in the seismic profile in pink. To orient you, here is depth on the y-axis and distance in kilometers on the x-axis, uh, which um, suggests that these, this seismic profile is highly vertically exaggerated. In this pink unit D, we observe internal reflections that dip seaward. And based on this, Slingerland et al. 2008 hypothesized they were, that they were formed as progradational four-set beds. And the geometry is outlined in the schematic um, by the pink box. And just note that clinothem geometry records the interaction of sediment supply and the creation or destruction of accommodation which is shown on this left axis. At the top of the schematic, accommodation exceeds sediment supply. And um, at the bottom of the schematic, uh, sediment supply exceeds accommodation. And three geometries that we commonly observe in the Gulf are progradational, which we observe here, aggradational, and transgressive. <clears throat> Slingerland et al. 2008 also proposed that they were formed during the last high stand in sea level or MIS 5A. And during the sea level fall to MIS 4, unit D was eroded. And this formed angular unconformities, which are indicated by AU, um, between unit D and the overlying unit C in blue. In some places, unit D can appear similar to unit C and we distinguish the two units in dip profiles as unit D has uh, dipping reflections and unit C has mostly horizontal reflections. The overlying relic clinothem is unit C and it's shown here in blue and it has horizontal and internal reflections. And this led Slingerland et al. 2008 to um, hypothesize that they were deposited as aggradational topset beds and likely during marine isotope stage three or MIS-3. Um, and this is the intermediate stage in sea level. Harris et al, 1996, sampled this unit for radiocarbon ages. And these ages correspond to the low stand between MIS-3 and MIS-2. When sea level fell during MIS-2, unit C was eroded and this formed channels and mesas. And it also truncated layers within unit C. And that's observed in the strike profile, which is shown here, and its location is here on the map. Uh, we observe uh, bathymetric highs, which the authors called mesas, and intervening bathymetric lows. <clears throat> the next layer observed are transgressive lag deposits, and these fill in valleys that were incised during MIS-2. 
We propose that their deposition occurred when sea level rose after MIS-2, which is shown here. And uh, uh, the location and thickness is dictated by the geometry of the underlying unit C. Radiocarbon ages from these deposits from our study and Harris et al. 1996 put them at around 6,500 to 3,800 years before present. And these deposits are lags. And uh, that's shown by the sediment core photo in the bottom left, where there are um, shell hash and sand in a muddy matrix. And um, for these lag deposits, erosion occurred more landward, but these deposits were transported seaward where they were ultimately deposited. The youngest uh, units are the modern inner midshelf clinothem or the Holocene clinothem. And this downlaps onto unit C mesas and transgressive lag deposits. Slingerland et al. 2008 subdivided the Holocene clinothem into three units that are separated by surfaces of lap S1 and S2. We named the yellow unit in Slingerland et al. A3, orange is A2, and red is A1. The bottommost unit, A3 in yellow, appears to be more aggradational. And we hypothesized that the aggradational geometries infill abundant accommodation in between mesas. And conversely, overlying unit A2 in orange appears to be more progradational, which we observe here. Um, we hypothesize that this is due to less accommodation that forces unit A2 to build the clinothem seaward. Slingerland et al. hypothesized that the surfaces of lap separating units A3, A2, and A1 represented truncation that occurred during meltwater pulses. The timing of these pulses is shown in the upper left. However, their study collected few age dates to constrain the sediment units and surfaces of lap. Um, furthermore, ages from Slingerland et al. 2008 include bivalve shells and bulk carbonate, and these may produce unreliably old ages. In our study, we, we acquired new radiocarbon ages from only benthic foraminifera, which may be more reliable than shells or bulk carbonate. And our new ages reveal that sediment units and surfaces of lap are younger than previously proposed by Slingerland et al. So here are three selected cores and their locations are shown on the seismic line below. Um, our new ages are shown in the regular font and ages from Slingerland et al. are indicated by uh, italic font. And this shows that uh, recent clinothem sediment is younger than 2000 years. And it also indicates that ages from Slingerland et al are several hundred years older than the ages that we obtained. <clears throat> During these time periods, or over the last 2000 years, there were no meltwater pulses. And thus, we suggest that the surfaces of lap were not caused by meltwater pulses, but rather by the interaction between accommodation and oceanographic currents. And we will talk about this next. Sorry, I apologize. I think there's a little bit of construction. I hope it's not too no noisy. Um, Slingerland et al. Uh, focus on the central gulf, whereas our study maps units across the entire gulf inner mid-shelf clinothem. And the map in the upper left shows the surface of the MIS-3 clinothem or unit C, which was in blue. And this was initially deposited flat. And yellow colors indicate shallower depths on this map, whereas blue colors indicate deeper um, depths. We observe that in the Southwest Gulf, the top of the MIS-3 clinothem is shallower and it is deeper in the Northeast Gulf. And we predict that the top of the surface can be dated to 20,000 years. This can be explained by differential subsidence due to modern isotopes modern isostatic adjustments to Foreland Basin formation. And again, uh, this is the schematic of the Foreland Basin and it has highlands corresponding to the Northeast and the shallow Gulf uh, corresponding to the Southwest. And there is a difference in depth between uh, the Southwest and Northeast Gulf of 33 meters. And if we divide this height over 20,000 years, we produce a subsidence rate of 1.65 millimeters per, per year, 
which is comparable to the rates from Slingerland et al. Also uh, note that the deformation of the Gulf operates in a direction this way that is orthogonal to sea level, which is in this direction. And as a result, we can tease out the tectonic signal from the sea level signal. Substance of the overlying unit C influences the thickness of overlying Holocene clinothems. And these are isopack maps of unit A2, which was orange, and unit A3, which is yellow. And in these isopack maps, red colors indicate thicker deposits and green colors represent thinner deposits. And this illustrates that these units are thin in the southwest and thicker to the northeast. Thus, tectonic deformation influences sediment thickness. And in the next slide, I'll focus on deposits mostly in the southern lobe. As the southern lobe has less accommodation, deposits are more likely to exhibit top lap. And top lap is evidence of a non-depositional hiatus, which is likely caused by sediment bypass and due to a lack of accommodation. Here are two strike lines through the southern lobe. So the top is uninterpreted, the bottom is interpreted. Um, line one above is located right here, and uh, line two is located just to the northeast of it. Um, we observe thin yellow and orange deposits on top of bathymetric highs. And note that there are also areas where there is gap, gas wipeout. <clears throat> In line one, unit A sediment is thin. And if we look at zoom two to the right, we observe top lap and truncation of yellow of uh, the orange unit. And in line two, we'll focus on zooms four and five, which are located here. And here we observe top lap of uh, and truncation of the yellow unit. And in zoom five, we observe uh, truncation of the orange unit. Since the southern lobe has less accommodation, we propose that oceanographic currents are more likely to erode and suspend these shallow deposits. And this leads to non-deposition and sediment bypass. As we just mentioned, oceanographic currents influence the geometry of clinothem deposits. And we will briefly talk about oceanographic conditions. There are two seasonal circulation states that affect short-term sediment transport and storage. The quiescent monsoon season occurs annually from fall to spring. Winds come from the Northwest, and as a result, the Gulf of Papua is in the lee of the mountains. And this map shows bottom currents uh, that are moving towards the Southwest and landward. And during the trade wind season, there's high wave, higher wave energy and waves resuspend sediment. Uh, this bottom plot also shows bottom currents Although I want you to note that the scale of the arrows between the bottom and the top plots are not the same. And thus trade wind seas and bottom currents are greater in magnitude and they also move towards the Northeast. <clears throat> Seasonal wave conditions also affect bed shear stress and sediment transport. And in the bottom plot is a figure from Walsh et al 2004 with bed shear stress on the y-axis and uh, water depth on the x-axis. And we observe that bed shear stress is greater during the trade wind season than during the monsoon season. And this schematic from Walsh et al. illustrates that the monsoon bottom currents deposit a temporary mud layer on clinothem top sets. And during the trade wind season, mud is eroded, resuspended, and transported offshore to the clinothem four sets where they are deposited as event beds. We have further evidence of rapid deposition of event beds. And here is a magnetic susceptibility curve for JPC 45. And this was published in Marcuson et al 2019. And we plotted new radiocarbon ages uh, to the right in the numbers here. Um, and these suggest that four set accumulation could represent meters per year. The stratigraphy that we observe in our seismic profiles corroborates Walsh's model of temporary deposition and remobilization. 
Um, however, we not only observe this in the cross shore direction, but also in the along shore direction. And so these three lines are um, three strike lines moving from landward to seaward. Um, on bathymetric highs, um, we observe a grading orange A2 units and stacking parallel reflectors. And we propose that sediment is temporarily deposited on these bathymetric highs during the monsoon season. And in the bathymetric lows, we observe prograding A2 units. And we propose that during the energetic trade wind season, bottom currents resuspend sediment on the bathymetric highs and northeast bottom currents infect sediment into the bathymetric lows. And we can relate our observations in the seismic profile to modern modeled currents. And the arrows on this map show the magnitude of direction of nearby currents during the trade wind conditions. And these are modeled using the Navy Coastal Ocean Model. And these nearby currents cause advection of sediment and progradation, progradation of the modern clinothem to the northeast, which we show by these orange um, shapes. This in turn builds the clinothem obliquely, and as a result, bathymetric highs and intervening lows shift towards the northeast. To summarize part one, uh, inner shelf deposits form during sea level high stands and are eroded during low stands. New ages reveal that Holocene clinothem units are younger than previously proposed by Slinger Lind. And surfaces of lap were not likely formed during meltwater pulses. They may have formed instead due to interactions between accommodation and oceanographic currents. And a main control on accommodation is foreland basin substance that creates more accommodation in the Northeast than in the Southwest. And Holocene clinothem deposits thicken towards the Northeast and clinothems in the Southwest are more likely to experience top lap. <clears throat> Observed stratigraphy corroborates models of seasonal circulation, sediment mobilization, and deposition. And this causes the clinothem to build obliquely into the northeast and build into bathymetric lows. And now I'll move on to part two. So part one, focus on processes that build the inner mid-shelf clinothem. And part two shifts our focus to the deep sea or Pandora trough. And our main question is, what is the fate of sediment that bypasses the inner mid shelf and travels to the deep sea? And specifically, we aim to investigate whether the Fly River responses to sea level changes differently than the Ferrari River. And to do this, we will use clay mineralogy as a provenance tool. The core locations are shown here at the right. At right. As I mentioned before, deposition on the inner mid shelf occurs during sea level high stands in intermediate stages. And that's shown by the area in the yellow box. And unit D was deposited during MIS 5A, um, unit C during MIS 3, and the Holocene uh, since the past 2000 years. During low stands, such as MIS 2, Sediment is deposited offshore in Pandora Trough. And we will focus on cores 33 and 66, and uh, they are shown in the seismic profiles below. Um, these also show thick deposits in a basin adjacent to carbonate reefs. In the next slide, I'll briefly review selected work on Pandora Trough sediment routing. How will it all measure sediment accumulation rates and clay mineralogy in order to determine during which time periods river sediment was able to travel to Pandora Trough. And they found high sediment accumulation rates during the Bowling, Alarod, and Younger Dryas. And they focused on these three cores in northern Pandora Trough. And Jory et al. examined turbidite stratigraphy proximal to carbonate banks. And during low stands, fluvial sediment reached Pandora Trough and served as the source of siliciclastic turbidites. However, when sea level rose, less siliciclastic sediment reached the deep sea. Nevertheless, rising sea levels during meltwater pulse 1b flooded an adjacent carbonate bank. 
and off-platform transport of carbonate caused the turbidites deposited during this period to be dominated by carbonate. Septima et al. 2017 investigated routing during the MIS-2 low stand and the following high stand using SEM MLA analysis on turbidite sediment. And they found that there were multiple compositionally distinct fans that deposited sediment in Pandora trough during the MIS-2 low stand. And that's shown by the bold vivid colors here where each color represents a different source. And by the late Holocene sea level high stand, sediment deposition was limited to Eastern Pandora trough. And as you can observe, uh, these faded fans are not active and the only active one is this red one. During the early high stand, the shell flooded and this activated longshore currents that transported sediment from the west to the east where shelf width is narrower in the east and it allows for deposition at this fan. In our research, we further investigate the influence of physiography on sediment delivery to the deep sea. And as I mentioned before, there are a long margin differences in physiography. Not only is the inner shelf wider offshore of the Fly River, but there are also three incised valleys offshore of it. Whereas offshore of the Parari River, there are no prominent incised valleys. And these incised valleys are important because they may maintain connections to the deep sea which is Pandora trough. As I just mentioned, uh, there are these three underfilled valleys offshore of the Fly River. And in the upper left is a three-dimensional view of the Fly River. And this is the location of our seismic fence diagram, which we zoom into in the bottom right. Um, we observe three valleys, the Kauai, Purutu, and Yamuda valleys that were surveyed by Crockett et al. And they may exist offshore of the Fly River due, the, due to the shallower shelf and differential subsidence. And this canyon morphology offshore of the Fly River appears to capture, capture and transport sediment to Pandora Trough during low stands in intermediate stages in sea level. And we will test this hypothesis with geochemistry. We can use clay mineralogy as a provenance tool because the mineralogy of suspended sediment changes from Southwest to Northeast. And here we observe that the Fly River in Torres Strait has around 45 to 48% illite. And this is shown by the yellow wedge and around 22 to 25% smectite, which is shown by the blue wedge. And this is in comparison to the Krikori and Ferrari rivers that have increasing smectite at the expense of decreasing illite. And this may be due to more abundant tephros and limestone in the Ferrari catchment. I also want you to note that uh, the percentages of kaolinite, um, which are in red, and chlorite, which are in green, do not vary much between these rivers. And therefore, in the next few slides, we'll compare the illite to smectite ratios um, rather than comparing all of the clay mineral percentages. Um, so the previous slide highlighted how the Fly River has high illite to smectite ratios and the Ferrari River has low illite to smectite. And the map above uh, shows how illite to shows illite to smectite of surficial sediment samples. And this builds on the work of um, Howell et al, Slingerland et al, and our study. Um, this not only reveals proximity to source, but also reflects oceanographic transport as fly river sediment is advected north and it mixes with sediment from the Bamu, Turama, Kikori, and Perari rivers in the central gulf. Modern patterns in surficial sediment are influenced by oceanography, but what about in the past? And through a sea level cycle, how was sediment routing influenced by physiography, tectonics, and oceanographic currents? So to examine these past changes in sediment dispersal, we looked at deposits within sediment cores, and we recovered four cores from clinothem bottom sets in order to examine changes in mineralogy through time. And within these cores, we recovered sediment deposited during sea level high sands, 
which is MIS1 in orange, yellow, and red, uh, transgressive lag deposits and green, MIS3 in blue, and MIS5 in pink. And here we are showing our measured values of down core clay mineralogy. On the x axis are illite dismectite ratios, and the y axis represents down core depth. To the right, in blue, are radiocarbon ages. <clears throat> in Holocene deposits, which are shown in orange and red, illite dismectite ratios are generally greater than five, which is similar to a fly river signature. And moving through the transgressive lag deposit in green, illite dismectite ratios decrease. Illite dismectite ratios decrease below five in MIS3, which is shown in blue. And this signature is similar to that of the Perari. In basal MIS5A deposits, however, illite dismectite ratios again increase above five, similar to the Fly River. And to complete our record during low stands, uh, we will examine the mineralogy of Pandora trough cores. Here are down core plots of illite dismectite for cores 33 and 66, which are here on the map. Uh, Pandora trough. Um, here again is illite to smec type ratios on the x-axis, depth on the y-axis, and uh, ages in blue. And these cores contain sand layers, which we highlighted by the gray and yellow uh, horizontal bars. And we also highlighted the low sand period in green. Uh, the illite to smec type ratios show wide variability because the turbidites have high light to smec type ratios. And we were initially motivated to sample on either side of the sands and more uniform sampling would have helped with these data. We observed that low sand deposits and sand layers have high elite dismectite, which resembles a fly river signature. And this suggests that fly river sediment can bypass the inner shelf during sea level low stands. Also, this suggests that the fly river is a likely source for some turbidites or sand layers. And based on the high illite dismectite composition of the sands, we hypothesize that during the high stand, the incised canyons captured deposits from storms or from longshore transport. <clears throat> in the schematic above, uh, we summarize illite dismectite signatures through time in the Gulf of Papua, inner mid shelf, and Pandora trough. And we observe high illite dismectite signatures during MIS-5A and the Holocene on the inner mid shelf. And we also observe high elite smectite ratios in Pandora trough during the MIS-2 low stand. Conversely, we observe low elite smectite in the inner shelf during the intermediate high stage of MIS-3. Why does it have a priority signature? In the next slides, we will walk through the stages and sea level and sediment routing pathways to explore this. <clears throat> First, we will start with MIS-5A, which is a high stand and sea level. And to orient you, this is the shelf break located offshore. And the shoreline is shown by the dark blue line. Colors of deposits correspond to sediment units. Um, so unit D is shown here in pink. Illite to smectite mineralogy is indicated by the colored outlines with green indicating a fly river source and purple indicating a perari source. And during the high stand, we observe high illite to smectite sediment proximal to the fly river. And we expect to observe low illite to smectite sediment proximal to the perari river. Sea level fell during MIS-4. And during this time, the MIS-5 clinothem was incised and eroded, and three valleys may have formed offshore of the Fly River. And this low stand allowed the Fly River sediment to bypass through these valleys and deposit in Pandora Trough, which is indicated by this cyan deposit. <clears throat> sea level rose to 50 meters during MIS-3, and during this time, we hypothesized that the Fly River sediment bypass through the three incised valleys to Pandora Trough. And the inner shelf clinothem at this time is composed of sediment with a signature similar to the Perari River with low illite dismectite. Sea level fell during the maximum low sand of MIS-2. 
and the MIS-3 climate then was eroded. Fly and Pirari sediment were deposited in Pandora Trough. And cores 33 and 66 are proximal to the Fly River, and these have high elytosmectite signatures. And finally, sea level rose during the Holocene. And proximal to the Fly River, we observe high elytosmectite. And proximal to the Pirari, we observe low elytosmectite. And there is mixing in between, which reflects northwest advection sorry, northeast advection of fly river sediment by currents. And the main difference between MIS-3 and the Holocene is the flooding of the inner shelf. And during high sand conditions like the Holocene, a long margin currents can be established and these advect fly river sediment to the northeast. Whereas during MIS-3, these currents cannot be established and it's possible that fly river sediment was captured by the submarine canyons and bypassed offshore. And thus, oceanographic currents depend on the degree of shelf flooding. To summarize part two, illite to smectite ratios track sediment routing to the Gulf of Papua, Papua in a mid shelf or to Pandora trough. And on the inner mid shelf, Surficial elytosmectite reveals proximity to river source and also mixing by oceanographic currents. And down core changes in elytosmectite reveal that fly river sediment potentially bypassed the Pandora trough during the sea level low stands of MIS-2 and the intermediate high stands of MIS-3. And the canyon morphology offshore the fly river may capture storm and longshore transported sediment. These canyons may exist offshore of the Fly River due to foiling basin subsidence. Um, the main difference between the MIS-1 and 5 high stands and the MIS-3 intermediate stage are the flooding of the shelf. And during MIS-3, a long margin currents could not be established, which allowed the Fly River sediments to bypass. So we looked at sediment bypass from the inner shelf to Pandora Trough, which are driven in part two by sea level cycles, accommodation, oceanographic currents and physiography on the timescales of a thousand to 10 thousands of years. And um, this is tied to part one in that we also looked at sediment bypass, but only on the inner mid shelf clinothem in the form of surfaces of lap. And um, our new age constraints found that they are not driven by abrupt sea level changes, but rather the interaction between accommodation and oceanographic currents. And this occurs on the timescales of, uh, of hundreds to thousands of years. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share the science and we'll take any questions at this time. Okay, uh, thank you, Emily. This is a great, great talk about the Gulf of Papa and uh, so, uh, uh, so far, you know, we have almost 60 source to sink related talks, and this is the first talk about Fly River. So maybe we will get a couple of colleagues talk about a little bit more about uh, the source part, and even yeah. all the way to the deeper trough part. And this is wonderful on the shelf. So we are, if you have any question, please go ahead to, now you're able to unmute yourself and ask Emily directly. So Emily, okay, when we're reading other colleagues' questions, so I have a question. You indicate during the trade wind, so there will be more strong wave, more resuspension, re and the sediment might you know, shift more to the southwest, right? Um, sorry, uh, yeah, so, sorry, could you repeat the question? I mean, during the trade wind, you know, there's a more strong wind, a more, you know, we will be suspension. So if that means the more sediment will shifted, you know, to further south, uh, southwest, right? Um, it'll move to the northeast. So during the trade wind, uh, the currents move towards the northeast. Oh, northeast, okay. Yeah, whereas during the monsoon, it's towards the southwest, but those are much weaker currents. And that's also shown by, uh, Walsh's studies where um, 
they used ADCPs and they also used, uh, sorry, maybe not ADCPs, but they used tripods uh, for current observations. And they also uh, used lead 210 to constrain mm -hmm. uh, these seasonal deposition cycles. And um, so uh, uh, the trade wind is really a lot more effective at moving okay, sediment than the monsoon. So uh, that means the predominant transport will go to the Northeast, right? Yes. Okay. And do you know, do you have the map show the total mud distribution in the Gulf Pop? I want to get a sense how far that those mud can go to Northeast. Uh, sorry, could you, so the extent do you of have, the current? Yeah, do you have the mud distribution, the overall in this area? Then we can get a sense how far those sediment will, you know, allow shore transport to the Northeast. Yeah, so I think uh, when Slingerland modeled these in uh, Slingerland at all, when they modeled it in their 2008 uh, circulation paper, I think they probably ended their modeling right where this line is. Mm -hmm. And um, I am not aware of any other papers in the Gulf of Papua that have modeled currents that move offshore. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, very good. So any other question from the audience? Hmm. Anybody? So, and um, the, the, also the core 33 and 36 in the uh, Pandora trough show hmm. the Holocene is only roughly about a meter, right? One meter. Yep, it's, and part yeah. of that is just the low sediment supply um, to this region during that time. And obviously there's a lot more siliciclastic input during the low stands. Sure. And there is that flooding of the carbonate bank and off uh, platform transports. So that does contribute to some of these turbidites mm -hmm. that are in the upper parts of the core. But I see that Andre Troxler is on and- Yes, hello. These cores. Hello, Emily, yes. I really enjoy your talk and I'm so glad Thanks. that uh, I was, you know, kind of informed about it. Thank you, Paul, for this. Hey, because, Andrew, yeah. You know, the, uh, the two communities that worked in the Gulf of Papua uh, were kind of so separated between <laughs> people working on the shelf and us working on the shelf edge and down in the troughs. And so I think what you have done uh, in particular in your part two, is very exciting. Yeah. It's, uh, it really shows, you know, kind of the, the link between the two. And to me, that was something missing, and I didn't know that you had done this. So I need to read your paper in 2020, I guess. Uh, but the, uh, I guess I will, because, you know, kind of this is very, very important kind of to be able to link, you know, kind of the, um, you know, the shelves and the troughs. Yes, I mean, there's this amazing switch in particular in the, uh, in the southern part or southwestern uh, part of silicic acid and carbonate. And the cores that you have shown or 33 and 66, 66 shows so well that, yeah. you know, kind of, we didn't penetrate very much in terms yeah. of the silicic plastics uh, or in terms of the, you know, low stand. Most of what we have had in our short cores were only, you know, sometimes doing MIS2 because there was so much deposit of silicic plastic in terms of turbidites, either muddy turbidites or, or you know, sand turbidites in that basin, that you, we really need some longer cores in order you know, to go and penetrate much deeper uh, into you know, kind of the time, yes? And so, and it might happen, you know, I, I might want to let you know, Emily, that there's a group, um, and yeah, Rosendahl is leading it, to try okay. to see if we could bring back, you know, the Jordi's resolution or not oh, back wow. because we never went there to bring okay. the Jordi's resolution there. Yes. That's there very good. Calls, yeah, there are calls that we did, you know, in um, on a following, uh, you know, cruise with the Mario Dufresne. Mm -hmm. And so there might be calls that we might, you know, if you are interested, you might want to go and look at them in terms of saying, what kind of uh, clay we might have, you know, in these cores, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So there's plenty of cores left. And I mean, we have amazingly, 
you know, kind of, uh, I mean, my postdoc and students and, uh, and the people from uh, LSU, you know, uh, from uh, Bentley and so on. I mean, did amazing work, but we are still, you know, having, uh, you know, some, I mean, I'm hoping, I just retired. I'm an emeritus now, but I'm still going to be active. I'm and uh, the Gulf of Papua is this absolutely fabulous place to work. And uh, your work, you know, is really beautiful. I really, really enjoyed you know, kind of uh, watching it, watching you talk and listening to you. So let's keep in touch. Yeah, oh, definitely. You? I'd like to do that. Thank you so much for that okay. feedback, Andre. So we, and, you, you're welcome. So, so we have a, a, a four there. So we'll raise your hand. Please go ahead. I'll mute yourself. Hi, Emily, this is Arnell. I just had a really yeah. quick question about your uh, seismic data, which is absolutely beautiful. And you can see significant features in there compared to where I'm used to working, which is the Gulf. <laughs> I just yeah. wanted to know, uh, with respect to your uh, chart profiles, was that all collected with the 512i system? Or did you have some additional seismics that were shown as well, especially in the deeper areas, such as in the trough? Yeah, so this was, this is Neil's Neil Driscoll's special chirp. It is a custom built one and not a 512. And I can maybe provide you with more details on his chirp uh, at a later time. And then unfortunately that chirp was having some issues during the survey. So then it also relied on uh, just like the shipboard Knudsen, um, which is the 3.5 kilohertz. And so actually many of the lines were collected with the Newton, but Perhaps it's just that this is muddier and there's all the stratigraphy that, and that's the reason why we can see so much more than in sandy parts of the Gulf. Mm. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, Emily, uh, I think a, 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 a wonderful part you present is you're able to show from state 5A of state five and then the state three and how the sea level together shifting the sediment from the mid, inner, middle, and to outer shelf. And this, this is a great story. And as Andres mentioned, you put that connected this together. So I think this is really, really amazing. And to be honest, we collect many similar this chapel in the East China Sea, South China Sea, even Andaman Sea. And we haven't really uh, coming to that stage three story yet. We found that kind of uh, the trunkage, the erosion of the stage three delta deposits on the shelf. Okay. But uh, here, I think uh, you, you, you have a very good start and it's, it's, it's very nice. And also we need uh, some deeper, deeper coding, you know, to re reveal the age. Definitely. And it would have helped if we could have recovered MIS-3 or older sediment from Pandora Trough. And I think um, Septima et al. had, um, they had done extensive age dating on their multiple cores. And I think there was only uh, the transition from MIS-3 to MIS-2 captured in M like MV-25, but that was about it. And Unfortunately, that core was not at U Miami. I think that might be at like LSU or somewhere else. Okay. So, so yeah. So Andre, uh, are you still there, right? So if, you, yeah, yeah, if yeah, you have yeah. time, maybe are you could, we also can you are happy to invite you here to talk about a little bit the deep sea part. Yeah. And because it is okay, even you can present the previous, uh, uh, even you don't have any new founding, uh, new 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 uh, uh, result because this uh, talk series will archive and uh, will become a great research and education resources. So we will record your talk for future reference. Good. If, so you are saying I should give a talk. I, yeah, I yeah, talk this is the invitation point. to you. No, I could give a talk, you know, uh, and we published a paper in 2013 on the origin of barrier reefs. Yeah. Showing that, um, Barrier reef, you know, are, um, set, uh, are are really growing on top of siliciclastic coastline, wow. and they mimic the uh, the morphology of the siliciclastic coastline, not only in the Gulf of Papua, but also in Belize, for instance. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's one talk I could try to give to you yeah. if you well, think that would well, be interesting. Okay, you know, for the uh, I, I will send you an email 
to, you know, then you can look at, you know, which data work for you, particularly after Emily's talk, then you can, uh, you know, reference her stuff, her two pe new paper, you know, back and forth, and together compare with what you found in the deeper part. Yeah, no, it's a good idea. That's a good yeah. idea. And uh, Emily, I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks. And also, I guess you are working now in Antarctica? Oh, no, sorry. This is... This is, this is from the Beaufort margin, it's just my background, but um, I didn't go to Papua New Guinea, so I just wanted to put a nice sea background. So, so yeah. what are you doing now in, um, in, uh, at USF? Uh, I'm at the, U yeah, I'm at the USGS and I, I moved a lot onshore and now I look at shore faces and uh, that's in New York, New Jersey, Virginia, and maybe in the Gulf. Okay, all right, but let's, let's, <laughs> Keep in touch and and find out if we have calls maybe from the Mario friend, which are much longer. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I know that Neil is also still very interested in Papua New Guinea, and I mean, I've I've done this for so long that well, yeah, still maybe keep working on it. <laughs> that would be great if we can get Neil, you know, uh, there before he retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe he never retired. <laughs> I think he will soon. At some point. <laughs> okay. Retirement right. doesn't mean that you are inactive. You have more time to do research. Oh, that's you know? good. That's true. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Andrew, I will uh, uh, can, uh, invite you by email, okay? Okay. Excellent. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. thank you, Emily. And also, I put the, the link of this talk on the chat. If you want to rewatch and you will send to the student or colleague, you can copy that link. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank right. you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.